So last weekend, I went to Topeka for my monthly focus weekend at Bishop Kemper School for Ministry. It's where I take classes for the diaconate. It's typically a pretty easy trip. I get on Highway 75 and go south for two and a half hours, and I am there. It offers some pretty landscapes along the way, and I often listen to an audio book or maybe a, a documentary of some sort, and I, I take that as me time. When I'm alone with my thoughts, it's a relaxation time for me, in, away from my busy schedule. This time, <laughs> my experience traveling down that road was different. A little over halfway there, I shut off my book because I suddenly heard a thump, 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 very rhythmically. It sounded like a flat tire. So I did what anyone would do. I pulled over, I looked at my tires, all four of them, they were fine, there was nothing on my dash. I thought maybe something from under my car was giving away, so there I am, looking under my car, trying to find something. There was nothing hanging, I didn't know what it was. So I figured I'd find a town along the way and try to get some help. I continued on my way. Eventually, I looked out of the corner of my eye and saw the seat next to me vibrating. <laughs> yeah, you laugh. <laughs> I was vibrating. And then the vibration went to my seat and then my steering wheel. <laughs> uh, I, I was in the middle of Kansas, in the middle of nowhere and I didn't know what to do. Well, I looked at my GPS, and the little town of Holton was about 15 miles away. Holton is, uh, I don't, it's just a, not, a little, little bit farther on is this Topeka. So I sit there, said a little prayer, started driving, hoping to make it. 15 miles north of Holton, which was 37 miles away from my destination at Topeka, I noticed the shaking was getting more violent, the thump, thump, thump was louder, and I was contemplating pulling over again. The decision was made for me when I suddenly heard a pop and it felt like something flew out from underneath my car. So I pulled over again, nothing on my dash, got out, none of my tires were flat, nothing, nothing was missing. I couldn't see anything on the road that came out from my car. So what did I do? I got back in my car and prayed that I would make it just 15 more miles. I was almost back up to full speed when I knew my hopes would not be fulfilled. There was a bounce and my car jerked. Fortunately, I was able to maintain control of the car and immediately got my southbound car on the side of the road. As I noticed in the mirror, my right rear tire was going westbound. Yep, as I was driving down the highway, my tire flew off my car. <laughs> See, I knew this would be audience participation. <laughs> Uh, know that I was grateful. I was grateful not to be upside down in a ditch with my tire. And I got out to see how bad it really was. So a tire is held on by five studs. Two of the studs were completely broken off. Two were bent, and all three of those remaining ones had shearing. It was really a bad situation. And my rogue tire was somewhere fairly close in the ditch. And there's more to that story before the tire went flying on its, its unauthorized field trip. And there's more after, but I'm gonna stay to the relevant parts. It was a scary time for certain. And like the men traveling on the road to Emmaus and our gospel lesson today, it would have been so easy to feel sad, mad, angry, fearful, wishing the situation was different. It would have been so easy to totally miss Jesus walking alongside of them or for me, or with me for that matter. But he was there in both cases. Thinking about my situation, where was Jesus exactly? He was in the beautiful blue sky that revealed itself as the dark storm clouds that had been following me my entire journey thus far had disappeared about the same time my tire went flying. The nice thing is I no longer had to sit in the rain and worry about trying to deal with the situation. Jesus was in the stranger who stopped and had all the necessary tools to help me get my tire back on, albeit with one lug nut, and make sure that the rest of my lug nuts were tight so that it would be easier to get my car onto a tow truck. 
He was in the miracles that happened when I was able to maintain control of my car and not careen into oncoming traffic or be hit by a car following me too closely. He was there when I didn't flip into the ditch, and he was certainly there when I was not injured at all. He was in the customer service person who searched and searched to find a tow company that would come that far out on a Friday afternoon and a mechanic that would stay late to fix my car when I could get to him. Jesus was with me the 35 miles I drove with the tire studs that were shearing off. I should never have been able to drive that far. He was with me as my family tried desperately to figure out how to get to me as quickly as they could, and then fixing the situation so that they, they didn't have to. He was with me as my fellow seminarians prayed for me and in their love as they hugged me when they saw me in class the next day. Most importantly to me, he was there when he put me in that car rather than my son, a much less experienced driver who often drives that car. As I shared in the earlier thing, not in my sermon, my son had heard the thump, thump, thump before that. He didn't tell me. Okay, love you, son. Um, truly, Jesus was with me on that trip, and just like he had been all my previous trips, those drives had never been me time. I just chose to make them that way. Jesus had always been along for the ride. As they say, hindsight is twenty twenty. Looking back, it is so easy to see all the ways Jesus was with me on that road. In the gospel, he was right next to those mourning men and that could not recognize him until he revealed himself when he broke the bread. Their hearts had been burning on that road with them while he was opening their, the scripture to them. And think about it. Jesus, the ultimate rabbi, the world's best teacher, was revealing the meaning of scripture directly to them, and they didn't recognize him. If they missed Christ's presence, it would have made sense for me to miss it too. So why is it so hard to see Jesus? It really isn't. Those men didn't expect to see Jesus. When you don't see someone in a context you normally do or expect to, you sometimes don't recognize them right away. Certainly in our own grief and suffering, we sometimes forget to see Jesus. Here's the difference. These men who Jesus walked with that day um, could, or excuse me, the difference is that those men didn't expect to see him. We, we can and should expect to see Jesus everywhere, in every circumstance, and in every person. We don't really ever have to look for him. He's there. Sometimes, albeit not always consciously, we choose not to see him. And let me give you some examples of what I'm talking about. Consider those moments when we are desperate, when we are in danger, when the world is turning upside down, when someone we love is sick or dying. Where is Jesus? He is there whether we pray or not. He's there in the hope for a good outcome and in our grieving when our deepest wishes fall apart. We may remember that, or we may not. How about a less intense situation? What about in the mundane day-to-day -day tasks? Do we see Jesus? He's there, but we often don't consider his presence with us. The Benedictines who take a vow to pray several times a day often spend time talking with God during their chores or work because they know he is with them and it's a great time to connect with him. I know I typically don't pray while I'm doing dishes or folding laundry or during my work day, but he's there waiting for me. Why is it so hard for us to remember that Christ is with us? The men on the road to Emmaus struggled seeing Jesus because they didn't realize that the risen Lord would and could appear to them. Today, we may not consider that the risen and ascended Lord can and will appear to us. The idea that he is always with us is often put in the back of our minds. We may tend to underestimate the value of that time where there are no extreme highs or lows in our lives. Jesus is there with us, but we don't necessarily stop and listen for him or call upon him in those times. The very reason Jesus left his disciples after his resurrection and ascended into heaven is so that the Holy Spirit could come 
the one that is to move our hearts and help open our eyes similarly to the way in which Jesus opened the eyes of the two men in the gospel reading. We cannot do it alone, therefore we never are alone. It's a little bit ironic that we come here regularly to worship together, which is an ordinary part of our times. It's definitely not mundane, but a normal and regular thing for us to do. Most Sundays are not the high of Christmas or Easter, and so it's not necessarily a bigger part of our our lives, or a bigger deal, it's a big part of our lives, but not a big deal. But we are here and clearly aware of Jesus' presence. We are used to seeing Jesus revealed in our worship. One way that is true is that as Episcopalians, we believe in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Another way is much more simplistic than that. When two or three are gathered in his name, we know he is here among us. When we pray and worship together, we are communing with each other. We're also communicating with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. However, I know for me, and I bet for many of you, once we leave this building and get on with the rest of our lives, it's easy to forget he's still there. In preparing for today's message, I read an interesting point of view on this t- gospel lesson. It's the fact that in this v- fairly short story, there is at least nine occasions where Jesus or his companions are moving. They're doing something. It may be like they came near, they went with him, he went ahead of them, he vanished, he broke bread, he opened their eyes. They're moving. Regardless of who was doing the movement, the purpose was to instruct us to tell the story of Jesus and to share it one way or another. From this, we are reminded that Jesus ultimately wants us to act or move as his church. Here's my point. He is always with us and calling us. We may, he may be calling us to act, whether it to be for ourselves or for others. He may be calling us to trust. He may be calling us to lean on him. He may be calling us to move for his, that is the church's, behalf. As I just mentioned, he is always with us and always calling to us. Sometimes it's simply to be with him. I challenge all of us to find those day-to-day moments where he is calling, to figure out ways to respond that we never have before, and then to just do it. Amen.